Hi, good evening, everybody. This is the last session of, for the year. And uh, here we have with me Dr. Suhil Suresh, who's also a, um, my colleague from Sunray. He's a consultant orthopedic surgeon and does uh, robotic surgery. So without further ado, we invite Dr. Suhil to give the talk. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, today, I'm honored to speak to you about how do I approach knee osteoarthritis? I'm sure many of you see this such patients. Um, uh, so yeah, so before I, 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 I go ahead, just to uh, make an announcement, uh, Saturday and uh, Friday is a public holiday for Kuala Lumpur uh, because we won the, 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 the city of KL won the uh, football match. Okay, so those of you working in KL, uh, uh, Friday probably don't have to go to work. Please check your schedules. You mean this okay. Friday? This Friday, the 3rd of uh, December. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, this day after tomorrow. Okay, so um, I work in the Sunway Medical Center. I'm basically an orthopedic surgeon uh, who has got a special interest in uh, arthroplasty or joint replacements, especially hip and knees. Um, so today's uh, talk, uh, um, the overview would be uh, give you some definitions and then you talk a bit about causes, uh, symptoms. Uh, signs of osteoarthritis, investigation, to and uh, last but not least, treatment options. Uh, I, 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 like, I always like to put up this picture. Uh, this picture was taken in Heidelberg when I was doing my uh, fellowship in Germany. Um, it, it's, it's a very interesting picture. Uh, it's, it's, it's a nice sculpture, a huge, very tall sculpture, which shows how important a joint is uh, to all of us. Uh, without a joint, we, can't, we cannot move. So um, and if you go back to our old, good old medical uh, school days, you know the major function of a joint is to allow you mobility. So without uh, a joint, uh, mobility is going to be very, very difficult. So we want to preserve mobility as long as we are alive because otherwise it's going to be very difficult for us and for our caregivers. So what's the prevalence of osteoarthritis? Uh, worldwide, uh, there are about 7% of, of the whole population, which consists of about 500 million people. Uh, women are disproportionately affected more. Uh, the ratio is uh, three uh, females to one male. Um, and in, in, in the greater Kuala Lumpur, uh, uh, greater um, KL, um, we have something like 30.8% of our population aged 55 years and above who are reported to have knee osteoarthritis. That means it's almost one in three uh, uh, of our population uh, especially in, in the greater Kuala Lumpur has about knee osteoarthritis. And I think uh, uh, overall in whole, whole of Malaysia is also about the similar figure. So what's, the, what, what's osteoarthritis? Um, let's look at this picture on your left-hand side of, uh, of the screen. Uh, basically, the yellow structure part is the, um, uh, what you call your bone, and the white structure is the cartilage. Uh, as time goes by, uh, the cartilage thins, uh, thins out and then eventually you get the subchondral bone become exposed. That's when the pain becomes more consistent uh, and permanent. And on, 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 on your right hand side, you've got a, a, a picture showing the uh, macroscopic uh, view of how a cartilage looks like. A cartilage is basically, basically pearly white, uh, shine, shiny um, uh, material uh, which overlies the bone. Um, and basically, in the first stage, you have cartilage fibrillation. Uh, at, at this stage, when you do an X-ray, you're not going to see anything. Unless you do an MRI, you're going to find slight thinning on the cartilage, but otherwise you, uh, on, a, on an X-ray, you're never going to pick up anything at all. Uh, and then if you, uh, if you, as, as it becomes uh, more uh, uh, progressive, you sometimes can pick up a bit of subcranial bone sclerosis, which is a white line uh, beneath the, 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 uh, the joint surface. And then eventually the cartilage thins out and then um, to the point where um, it becomes irregular and you begin to see marginal osteophytes or osteophytes in the sides of the bone. And eventually you begin to see cysts. Now, um, this cyst formation is actually a very interesting uh, uh, characteristic uh, because uh, it first starts with the microfracture of the cartilage and then uh, because of the pressure in the cartilage, the joint fluid enters the subchondral bone and eventually it forms a cyst. So sometimes you, the cyst can be quite large and the cyst sometimes can be picked up on an X-ray. So who gets them, where and why? Um, as I said earlier on, the uh, females 
more often than male, where uh, basically osteoarthritis can affect any joint, but predominantly joint, uh, weight-bearing joints, um, knee by far more common than hip, and then comes ankle. Of course, sometimes it can happen in your wrist um, and also in the cervical spine. Um, why there are many causes for osteoarthritis, uh, uh, depending on whether they are primary or secondary. So primary osteoarthritis, as we all know, uh, there's no other cause. Uh, basically, age-wise, uh, because of age um, progression, um, wear and tear, uh, somebody can get uh, osteoarthritis. But uh, there's the other group, which is the secondary osteoarthritis, which is quite common as well, uh, especially post-trauma. Um, Rarely you get uh, osteoarthritis if you have a mid shaft femur fracture or mid tibia fracture, but if you if someone gets a um, fracture around the joint or periarticular fractures, then yes, they are more predisposed to getting uh, osteoarthritis. And the earliest is actually about anywhere up to about five years if the joint surface is not well reconstructed. Infection is another culprit. Uh, sometimes patients end up with septic arthritis. You treat them for, for septic arthritis and then they go away. Many years later, they come back because there is chondrolysis of cartilage uh, degeneration as a result, damage as a result of the infection. And of course, there are other causes like psoriasis, gout, rheumatoid arthritis. Now, um, majority of the male patients that I see uh, who have osteoarthritis um, uh, are usually as a result of uh, hyperuricemia leading to gouty arthritis uh, uh, and, and, and rheumatoid arthritis is more predominant in females. Um, uh, this is an x-ray of, uh, of someone who has got osteoarthritis. Um, uh, basically, you can see, uh, appreciate uh, the distal interphalangeal joints eroded, the joint space narrowed. Uh, and if, in, in, in this picture, uh, in the thumb, you can even see the uh, uh, proximal interphalangeal joint, uh, subluxating. Um, so basically, um, the, the, the cartilage wears off, uh, the joint becomes unstable, uh, they form nodules in the, in the joints, uh, and, and then they, they uh, present with uh, deformities of the joints in the fingers. So symptoms, majority of the patients will come to you. Um, but in the early phase, usually is pain. And then occasionally, uh, sometimes when there's an acute bout, uh, if there is swelling. And then, uh, well, of course, in, in, in the chronic stage, they present to us with the deformities, either a virus or valgus deformity. Now, majority of the time, in, if it is primary osteoarthritis, is a virus knee, um, whereas if it is uh, either post-traumatic or rheumatoid arthritis, they're usually a valgus knee. Um, so, of course, occasionally you get patients coming and telling you, you know, something like how this picture goes, uh, this cartoon shows, it makes a creaking, moping sound every time I get in and out of the car. So he actually went to see the, the mechanic and thinking that it was his car door, but in real fact, it was his knee <laughs> that actually uh, was making the creaking sound. So sometimes patient comes to us and say that, you know, my partner says that, you know, my, my joint keeps creaking every time I, I, I move or get out or get uh, out or, or get onto a chair or get out of, uh, of a chair. So yeah, so uh, crepitus uh, creaking sound is also another presentation that we occasionally find. Signs, uh, deformities, reduced joint motion, um, they get limitation of range of motion um, because the capsule becomes tight, the muscles become uh, uh, contracted uh, because of pain and they are not moving. Grating sensation, this rough feeling when you put your hands on, the, on, on, on top of the patella and of course, joint line tenderness and occasionally, like I mentioned just now, swelling in the resecution. Uh, this is another uh, nice picture of a lady who has got bilateral uh, valgus knee. Uh, the right knee is more pronounced compared to the left knee. Uh, but you can also appreciate, apart from her knee, you can see that her feet, her ankle, and her, her toes are all uh, inwards because she's trying to compensate to stabilize her knee. So she's got secondary deformities of her toes and her ankle. So by this stage, when they come to see us for knee osteoarthritis, they also already have some amount of ankle osteoarthritis. So that's it's, it's why it's very important to catch them early and treat them early rather than allowing them to become uh, much uh, much delayed. And in, in these kind of cases, can you can imagine how bad the spine will also be because of uh, trying to compensate for the unequal uh, weight distribution that they've had. So investigations generally uh, for osteoarthritis, 
a radiology investigation is more than sufficient to make the diagnosis and after a clinical proper clinical assessment. But occasionally you want to rule out um, rheumatoid arthritis, you want to rule out gout, you want to rule out uh, any other form of uh, uh, secondary causes, then probably a blood investigation uh, would, uh, would be necessary. So um, these are some x-rays uh, which allow us to, uh, sorry, uh, let me just go back one. Yeah, so um, the top left-hand side, we can see the, 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 this picture, basically the top is an x-ray and the bottom is a diagrammatic uh, representation of the x-ray, uh, which allows us to get easy to understand what the x-ray is all about. So that's the distal end of the femur, that's the proximal end of the tibia. And you can see on the lateral side, the joint space between the two white lines uh, is reasonably well preserved. But on the medial side, you can see there's significant narrowing. And on the next picture, you can hardly, uh, barely make out the joint line. So it's a very, very thin line. So you can imagine this is almost like an ankylosed knee already, which is like almost like a fused knee. And the other picture on this side, <clears throat> you can see on the sides, there is a bone spur. And this black cavity is actually the cyst, the subchondral cyst that has become so huge. Uh, and also you've got cysts on the distal femur as well. Um, uh, this picture uh, is, 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 is the x-ray of the lady, early, lady earlier on. So you can see um, her knees are valgus. There's hardly any joint space. The joint line is unequal. One is higher than the other. Even the other knee has got no joint space left. Whereas this picture um, is a varus knee where um, the joint space is completely gone. The medial compartment is so badly, uh, the cartilage is so badly eroded, so much so that, you know, now she's beginning to lose bone instead of only losing uh, cartilage. Uh, and this makes the surgery a bit more um, uh, challenging, um, uh, difficult, and also the cost of the implant for such late stages is even much more expensive, almost double than the normal primary uh, knee replacement implants. So that is another reason why uh, somebody should be motivated to have the surgery done much earlier. Now this, uh, um, once you've seen all those bad ones, then you can, you can try and appreciate the normal x-ray. So basically when we order a knee x-ray, ideally it should be a, a AP and lateral. Uh, possibly a standing view is good because if you use a standing view, you can actually gauge the, the thickness of the cartilage. So the distance between the two white lines of two, uh, 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 um, ends of the bone, which uh, end, uh, which represents the cartilage thickness, has to be around six to eight millimeters in, in, in normal cases. And uh, you're not supposed to see any uh, uneven surfaces in the sides of the bone. They should be very clean. Uh, they shouldn't have any osteophytes. So that's how a new, uh, 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 what do you call a normal x-ray supposed to look like. So, <clears throat> so uh, a bit on the treatment, which is uh, we usually speak about non-pharmacological, but by the time the patient actually arrives at my suite for consultation, they were already probably done most of this stuff. Uh, and, and these are something, some of the good, good things that as, as a general practitioner uh, or if you, uh, when you're seeing a patient or if you're advising your family members, uh, these are good things to, to follow. Uh, of course, weight reduction, when you reduce body weight, the load on the knee is lesser. Every kilogram that the uh, patient loses, in body weight, uh, there's a four kilogram reduction in, 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 in the load on the knee joint. So modifying activity, um, do the things that they can do rather than do the things that they cannot do and then injure themselves or wear off their knees even worse. Uh, use walking aids where, whenever necessary. Uh, regular exercises to, uh, uh, to maintain the elasticity of the tendons and ligaments and to make sure there's no contracture. Uh, occasionally, you can wear a brace or a splint uh, when you are playing a game uh, or, or doing certain kind of sports or doing some activities. So um, the, the, the good old uh, phrase about uh, walk rather than run, sit rather than stand, uh, it still holds true. That means if, if a patient can walk, uh, then they, it's better for them to walk rather than do a running exercise. And if they, ha if they can afford to sit, they probably have better for them to sit than, than stand when doing a certain thing. This is for, this, this is for I, 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 I must, um, what do you call, uh, explain further that this is basically for patients who have osteoarthritis, not for uh, patients who are normal. Um, okay, so <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, the other thing, when we spoke, speak about brace, uh, this is an interesting brace that some of the patients like to use. Uh, so basically, the alignment in this first picture uh, shows that the patient has got a varus knee. So the patient can get such braces where there is a force on the, on, 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 on the sides to make sure that the knee is well corrected so that um, it doesn't become too varus and they can move around. So this lady, one of my old patients, um, we fitted her with one and then she came back and she said, no, I, 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 I want another one. For me, I thought it was a bit more cumbersome for me to wear this and walk around, but she was very, very comfortable. When she wore this, she, ne she didn't have to have take painkillers and her knees were much straight and uh, she, she was going around using this for a very long time. Um, yeah, so these are one of the few things that you can do and they can have reasonable range of motion and when they're resting, they can take it off. Uh, yeah, but some patients prefer to do this. Uh, and this, are, this, this is also an alternative for patients who cannot undergo surgery um, uh, for any, any particular reason. Uh, pharmacological options, uh, basically whatever we are doing is we are giving them pain relief. Um, it extends from the NSAIDs, opioids and uh, COX-2 inhibitors. Now, um, I, I tend to be a bit careful with NSAIDs in, in this group because we know this is going to be a chronic problem. And um, so basically the NSAIDs or the COX-2s, uh, I, I, I use them as a rescue medication and I keep, keep them on either paracetamol or opioids, uh, opioids uh, in, 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 in the background. So uh, either one or two tablets, uh, two tablets once or twice a day in terms of paracetamol and then if need be uh, opioids. Um, occasionally when it's really very, very painful, they can use an NSAID uh, because sometimes some of them start off with having osteoarthritis as early as 50 and they go on for many, many years. Um, when, when by the time they come and see you for a knee replacement, maybe when they are 60, um, uh, I, I always tease, the, tease them and say that, you know, they probably barbecued their, their kidney already by then. So it <laughs> the, increases the risk of surgery and the complications. So uh, the other options available are disease modifying drugs like glucosamine sulfate and chondroitin. And there's also a combination that you can use either glucosamine sulfate plus chondroitin. Um, uh, the other uh, important uh, uh, pharmacological uh, option that we have is uh, intraarticular injections. Basically intraarticular injections, uh, there are three types, uh, steroids, PRPs and uh, platelet rich products and also hyaluronic acid. I generally tend to use more hyaluronic acid and occasionally steroids. Uh, if a patient comes in, um, young patient, we usually try and avoid the steroids unless they have got a very severe bout of uh, inflammatory arthritis. Uh, and the knee is very swollen, very painful. Uh, you feel um, that there's significant synovium uh, inflammation, then probably a steroid will help together, uh, either in, uh, independently or uh, together with a, with a combination of a hyaluronic acid. Um, PRPs, um, yes, quite a, uh, quite a lot of people uh, use PRPs. Um, the, the, there are various studies, but I think the general consensus is if you use PRPs in the early phase, um, especially after the injection, there's an inflammatory reaction. So the patient tends to have a bit more knee pain for the first, at least up to a week. And then in the, after a week, they tend to do better than the hyaluronic acid. Uh, but at the end, after beyond six months, uh, both the hyaluronic acid patients and the PRP patients do about the same. Uh, there's not much, there's no clinical uh, statistical significance between the, the difference of PRP and hyaluronic acid. Uh, apart from that, uh, the other thing that stops me from using PRPs is uh, the insurance companies don't cover PRPs for most of my patients almost all my patients. So unless the patients are self-paying, um, yeah, but then uh, patients must understand what they're getting into. Um, so if you're using PRP injections, uh, ideally you should, uh, what you call, um, prescribe them strong pain relief medications because they're going to come, they're going to go back home and then they're going to have quite a significant knee pain and they prob probably think that they have got septic arthritis by the time they come back and see you. So must be very, very careful um, as compared to hyaluronic acid. Um, this was a, a study um, which we carried out some years back in UKM. I think it was in 2000 and, um, 2004, 2005. Uh, basically, um, uh, patients, the, this is the number of patients and this is the number of weeks after an intraarticular injection. And basically, we 
to the Macpherson uh, score to see the functional ability of the patient. So um, from zero to two weeks, um, there's a significant number of patients who say, yeah, they've improved. And um, uh, static, well, uh, somewhere in the middle and um, the worst ones are down, uh, become lesser. So obviously before, when they start, they actually got more pain. Uh, after two, after, uh, after two, between two to eight weeks, there's still uh, quite a good lot of people who actually have improvement. And then eventually eight weeks down up to about 24 weeks, which is up to six months, the efficacy of the injection drops a bit. And then either they become uh, static, uh, but they don't become terribly bad. Uh, but beyond nine months to a year, uh, they tend to have pain back um, because the, the injections last them anywhere up to nine months uh, to a year. But occasionally patients do come back and tell you, say, you know, I've had this injection, it last, lasted me for two to three years. That's probably because they, they, they had the injection when they are in the very early stage rather than at late stage. You know, at, at grade three, grade four, uh, rarely they last more than a year. Uh, in grade four, even maybe up to two to three months. So generally in my practice, um, if I give them an intraarticular injection and they come back after two weeks, uh, or I mean, within two months, or three months, I tell them that look, there's no point having another second intraarticular injection because you're probably not going to do well. So you're better off um, having surgery rather than spending your money having intraarticular injections, especially if you use a high molecular weight intraarticular injection. So um, manager, management algorithm, so lifestyle modifications, a uh, bit of acetaminophen, uh, NSAIDs, COX-2s, uh, steroid injections, opioids, um, and then yeah, yeah, the next step is hyaluronic acid injections. And then if, if that fails, then you probably need to refer the patient to for surgical intervention. Um, so um, and in the good old days, you only talk about knee replacement, knee replacement for osteoarthritis. But um, now there's a bigger move towards cartilage uh, preservation surgery. Um, some of these procedures have been around for the longest time, but uh, never been uh, popularized. But now there's a uh, re-emergence of uh, popularizing uh, what you call cartilage preservation surgery, especially for the younger patients, uh, because we know that if you do a knee replacement for someone who is young, there's a lifespan for these implants, anywhere within 20 to 30 years, depending on how young they are and how active they are. So uh, the other options available are arthroscopic debridement. Uh, we'll go ahead and explain a little bit more. Chondrocyte transplantation, hyalopass, and osteotomy. Arthroscopic debridement basically is a washout. Uh, we wash out all the, the, the debris, the synovial fluid, which contains all the chemical mediators, uh, take away some of the osteophytes, uh, address the meniscus, uh, which uh, degenerative meniscus, which is torn. Uh, osteochondral oleographs. So now basically this picture shows you uh, a picture of how we take, uh, let's uh, look at this, let's look at this top picture. So someone has got uh, damaged cartilage in this area. So what we do is we take the non-articular surface cartilage and then we put it uh, into uh, the, the, the damaged area and it looks like this. So basically what you're doing is you're applying MOSAC on the floor. Uh, so oh. orthopedic surgeons from becoming carpenters and now become tile. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is the other thing that you can do. So you put all this uh, so basically, the, 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 the periphery part where the cartilage is not articulating, it's, not, it's already not necessary. So you can take that and then you can implant it in this damaged area. So And then eventually, as, as years go by, they act as a, just like a graph, basically. So you have that, you have an option of either allograph or autograph. Uh, so this is, another, this is a picture of one of the cases that we did. So basically, we took out the cartilage from the uh, non-articular surface and then uh, cleaned up the center. And if you can appreciate, this is the non-articular surface in the side. That's the middle groove. So you've planted the cartilage on the, in, on, on, on the groove in the center. Uh, and with this, the patient can go on for, 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 for years. So uh, the, the, the other name for this procedure is called mosaicoplasty. Of course, sometimes you, you can't find a uh, good um, uh, autograph, then you can probably take um, allograph from a cadaver and also uh, plant it in. Um, so yeah. sorry, uh, Suhil. So when you take the autograph, right, uh, the the area that you have taken it from, it will regenerate back. No, the area will be covered by uh, fibrocartilage, um, and uh, that area is because it's a non-contact area. 
So it doesn't uh, doesn't cause I see. any problem. So basically, you're taking somewhere that is non-contact to put ah. the contact area. Yes. So it does not regenerate back. back now. It, it will not regenerate. In that okay. Area. Okay. So um, uh, this is another example of a patient who has got um, basically this one is osteochondral allogram. So basically, the patient has got a, a deformity, um, and then we correct the deformity. Uh, by using uh, by doing an osteotomy, we take out a small wedge, correct it, wow. put the plate in, and then that part of the uh, uh, cartilage which is damaged, we slice it and remove it, and then we use a graft from an allograft uh, from a cadaveric donor, and then we put that piece back and then put a screw. So then the allograft will incorporate onto this patient's bone, and then eventually that will be his host bone. Uh, similar to this picture as well, where the 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 the, the, the degenerated cartilage is removed, uh, like a small uh, uh, tile piece, and then we take the cartilage from the the cadaver uh, in a nice uh, right rightfully measured uh, space, and then we put it back inside here, and then we put some uh, uh, what do you call minor some small screws to to keep it in place. So that's another technique. So basically, you don't have to. You address but this the caveat to all this is the lesions must be very small, uh, like one by one cm, uh, one point five by one point five cm, nothing more than that. But if you've got generalized osteoarthritis, obviously you cannot you cannot do. When such. you take from the cad cadaver, they mm -hmm. sell it like that, uh? Yeah. So we can we 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 um. So we when we order the cadaver, uh, we can tell them that we want a distal femur, uh, an articulating surface. So they will they will sell it to us at, at, at that price and at, 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 uh, whatever we want. So if you want a tendon, they will sell us a tendon. If you want a ligament, they will sell you a ligament. Really? Yeah. So you can you can have parts, uh, different parts of the body uh, utilized for different things. Like spare parts. Yes, something like spare parts. Yeah, something like spare parts. And where for did the, they come for from? The sake of science, for the sake of science. Where do they usually come from? This this. Um, well, we have our own. Uh, Tissue bank, um, the 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 most commonest place we get our our tissues is from the tissue bank in uh, it's a very well set up tissue bank in Kuban Korean uh, Hospital H U S M. Um, um, we have uh, uh, another bone bank in uh, H K L. Um, these are two places that we can get. Of course, uh, sometimes when uh, we don't have our own uh, donors to give or the bank do not have enough. Uh, of uh, such uh, products that we can uh, get them from uh, abroad. Uh, I think some of them come from uh, US. There are a couple of companies from US which uh, uh, export uh, allografts to Malaysia. Uh, so there's a few companies interesting. With, the, with the approval approval from the Ministry of Health. Of course, these are tested there. Um, the donors are tested, and then eventually, uh, the after the window period, they are tested again. And then there, there are certificates issued for all these allografts before they are brought into the country. So yeah, the, 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 that's available. So you can get allografts from uh, different for different parts of the body. Okay. So the other thing is autologous chondrocyte implantation. So basically, um, this is a picture of um, not very clear, but uh, this is a picture of a patient with osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, if you can appreciate, that's the femoral condyle. Uh, that's the other condyle. The, the, the patella is somewhere around here. So basically, we are seeing from lateral, and you can see a huge uh, crater on this side, and this all these are osteophytes. So basically, this is the damaged area. So what we, we did is uh, we actually uh, take the patient's cartilage, and then we um, we grow the cartilage outside uh, in, a, in a bank. And then uh, after about six, week, uh, six weeks, we bring back the cartilage. And then uh, what we do is we, we clear that, that, that damaged area and then um, cover this, 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 this covering is actually part of the periosteum. So we, we, we take periosteum from outside on the femur side and then we stitch it onto the bone and then from a space here, we inject back the cartilage inside. So eventually the periosteum will incorporate with the cartilage and then uh, the patient will have his or her own cartilage. Um, Again, this this lesion, these procedures can be done only for small lesions, uh, not for everybody. This is another thing that's been popularized recently now. Uh, it's, it's called hylofast implantation. So basically, this is a picture of a patient who has got 
bad osteoarthritis and one of the femoral condyles. So what we do is um, we do an arthroscopy and then we uh, what we, we call is uh, at the end of the arthroscopy, we, we drain out the, all the uh, joint fluid in the water and then we make small holes in the subchondral bone to bring in uh, uh, blood and uh, neovascularization from the subchondral bone. And then we, 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 we patch this with, uh, uh, with, with a gel-like substance uh, called a hylofast. And then we cover it with a, a periosteum. And sometimes uh, we could even add some bone marrow onto this. Um, uh, and that will also allow the cartilage to grow. Uh, this has also uh, uh, been very, very promising. The only downside with such procedures is once it's done, the patient may not be able to wait bare for some time. If you're looking at anywhere within four to six months, you can't wait bare on that knee uh, until the cartilage grows. So that's that's sometimes something that not very many patients can accept, not being able to wait bare on the knee for four to six months. But then again, if it's a young patient, these are the options that they have as compared to going for a knee replacement because no one in the right mind will do a knee replacement for somebody who is less than 50, 55 years old. Um, so yeah, so these are the options for younger patients. Now high tibial osteotomy is basically um, uh, to correct the malalignment or the misalignment of, of, of someone. So basically um, this patient has got a varus knee. Uh, we can cut some parts of the bone and then uh, uh, cut and then realign the thing and put some staples to make the knee straight. So this is another process. But, uh, procedure without having to go for a knee replacement. Uh, of course, knee replacement surgery is, has been around for the longest time. Uh, there are many different types of implant that are available today. Uh, I just want to highlight this, this top implant, which has got uh, basically the, the, the femoral condyle and the tibial base plate, and has got these two rods. These are usually done for revision cases with this rod. So if you see someone's x-ray with a rod going with a knee replacement implant plus a rod inside, it's highly likely that it was actually a revision knee replacement, uh, not a primary knee replacement. So, okay, so we also have gender specific knee. So we realize that sometimes uh, some of our female patients have got very uh, narrow trapezoidal bone as compared to the male patients. So the traditional implants may have maybe a bit too broad for them and this will probably impinge onto their soft tissue. So now we have a female uh, version for some of the patients. So at the end, when before we implant the final implant, we do a trial, and then we decide whether we put we want to put the broad one or the or the narrow one, uh, depending on the patient size. Like you see, if you, if you look at, if you could appreciate this picture on the bottom, if I put this implant in, this is the trial implant. You can see how much it's overhanging. You can see the shadow. Uh, so this is going to impinge on the soft tissue, and that's not going to be very comfortable. And the patients may complain of uh, of knee pain even despite having the knee replacement surgery. Um, then we also have custom made implants. Uh, we have patients who are dwarf, patients who are not, uh, who have got very abnormal uh, morphometry of their bones. And in these kind of patients, uh, we are looking at you know needing um, uh, very specific custom made implants. So we do a scan, CT scan, and then we send out the CT scan pictures uh, together with your 3D reconstruction to the manufacturers, and the manufacturers will uh, will, will make the implants based on that. Why not MRI? Eh? Why CT scan? Uh, CT scan uh, is, 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 is very good for bone. Uh, MRI gives you a lot of uh, soft tissue. Uh, I see, I see. Tissue, okay. Yeah. Um, getting overshot. Okay, so now the, the, other, the, other, the other implants that we have for knee replacements are uh, implants specific for the, for the compartment that is, uh, which is damaged. So in the good old days, anybody who has a knee, uh, osteo very bad knee osteoarthritis, if they have failed medical management, we put them up for a total knee replacement. Today, we don't do that. We uh, try very hard to preserve the ligaments, preserve the soft tissue, and change whatever wound that is necessary to be changed. So for example, in this patient on your left, far left, you see, that's the femoral condyle. You just basically see one small dot there. That's the patella, which has been, uh, been opened up. And on the top picture, you can see how bad the patella looks like. So the femur looks pretty pristine, whereas this the patella looks bad. Uh, the cartilage is degenerated quite significantly. So for this patient, if you go and do a total knee replacement, it's actually overkill. So what we do is we do a patellofemoral joint replacement. So basically, the button goes on the patella, 
and then the, the this metal component goes in the, in the center where the trochlea is, and then you've got an articulating surface. So the ACL, PCL ligaments, medial lateral collateral ligaments are all preserved. So uh, it's very much like a natural knee. Uh, you don't, you, you, apart from the pain that you've had from the, uh, the patient would have had from the patellofemoral or anterior knee pain, now the patient wouldn't have had the knee, anterior knee pain anymore yet. Very stable knee and uh, very quick recovery, very small incision. You can go back home within two or three days. They don't have to stay in the hospital very long. And their uh, post-op rehab is also very, very simple. You can even use a walking stick rather than use a walking frame. Um, Biopoly is another uh, new thing that we, we use. So someone has got, uh, again, this is the trochlear area. Um, you can appreciate where um, that's the femoral, medial and lateral femoral condyle. That's the center groove. So if that part is damaged, um, we can use a punch to remove that area. And the punch has got a sizer. It, you can measure the size. And then you can pick out from the shelf the polyethylene, which is the size, same size as the, as the punch. And then you can replace just that particular portion. Similarly, you can do that for the patella as well. Uh, but you can't do it for the, for the trochlea and the patella together. You can only do it for one surface. Um, so again, uh, quick recovery, uh, ligaments all balanced, uh, very fast going go, for the patient to go back home. The pain relief is also almost uh, quite instantaneous. Um, okay, this, this is more, a bit more popular, uh, unicondylar knee replacement as compared to the, the other things which I mentioned just now. So if, if you have 100 patients who have got knee osteoarthritis, maybe 10% will probably fall in the unicondylar group, where, where, whereby only one compartment uh, this in this patient, and, and most of the time is the medial compartment uh, because of the way the mechanical axis moves. So the medial compartment gets worn off very much. The lateral compartment is pristine. So we go in, we replace the, the, the medial compartment only. Um, so this is how it looks like. Uh, the femoral component on the top, that's the polyethylene in the center and a small base plate. So the part of the cartilage in the medial side is shaved off. And then we replace it with uh, with the metal and the uh, and, and the prosthesis. And this last picture is uh, is, is the surgical picture of a patient which has got a unicondylar knee replacement. Uh, patient comes in in the morning, does the surgery in the afternoon, stays for another two nights, and then goes back home um, with a walking stick. And then uh, can start driving within a week, uh, full recovery within two to three weeks, and the patient's back to work. So almost immediately, uh, so very, very quick, uh, quick fix, uh, very little, um, uh, what do you call, um, uh, risks, um, the risk for, for, for a, a unicondylar as compared to a total knee replacement is almost half in everything like deep vein thrombosis with less by 50%, infection rate less by 50%. So um, hospitals stay and the cost is also much cheaper. So again, but, but must be caught early, um, early in the sense that uh, the presentation must be quick um, before the entire whole knee becomes uh, damaged. Uh, this one is a bicompartment. That means the patient has got the patellofemoral and the, and the what you call uh, medial compartment. So instead of the three compartments, now we have got bicompartment. Uh, not very commonly done though, but uh, but it, it is an option. But but because by the time the patient has got two out of the three compartments. Uh, needing replacement, the patient is probably better off having a total knee replacement. Uh, this is a picture of a, a, a severe uh, total knee, uh, severe osteoarthritis of the knee. You can, uh, if you can appreciate this top right picture, that's an end on view. The patella is diverted on this side. That's where the patient's body is. This is the foot end. Um, that's the entire femur that you are staring at. Uh, end on, that's the lateral femoral condyle. That's the medial femoral condyle. You can imagine the medial femoral condyle has a huge crater, a huge like hole, uh, basically. Um, so there's nothing left there. And you can imagine patients like this still can walk around in our country. Um, and that's the, the, that's the medial side of the tibia. And this is another picture of the same patient. You can appreciate how deep this crater is. Um, but yeah, we can walk. Um, why? Uh, sometimes fright, sometimes not confident. Uh, sometimes ill-informed, um, sometimes basically not, not, they don't have the means to do it. Um, and many of the times it's usually uh, ill-informed patients. Um, people tell them that, you know, doing a knee replacement won't give you good results. You'll probably worse off than uh, 
worst off uh, having a knee replacement than without. So with that, they walk around with this until they cannot walk and then they, they, they find their quality of life is so badly affected and then they come to us. Um, Okay, so one of the few, few things that we've been doing before um, uh, is computer-aided surgery. So why, 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 the question is why all this technology, why can't we just use the implant that we already have? So over the years, there's, there's a lot of uh, improvement that has been done on the implants. Uh, so the question is why, why would you want to improve implants which are already good? So basically, we want to try and stretch the number of years these implants can last. Um, the conventional implants usually last a patient anywhere up to about 20 years. Um, so uh, 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 after that, um, a lot of minor improvements have been made to stretch the implant uh, longevity. So um, one is material. Uh, we have changed materials from, oops, sorry. Uh, one, we have changed materials from cobalt chromium to titanium to what you call ceramic. Uh, we have changed the polyethylene from high density polyethylene to cross link polyethylene. All that has pushed up things. But then uh, what we also have in our hands is when we implant all these implants onto patients, we use jigs. So jigs are based on general uh, population size uh, and morphometry and angles. So um, what people came up with was, is with computer-aided surgery. Basically, the computer aids you in placing the implant in the right position. So if your implants are placed in the right position, if you don't have outliers, uh, they will last you even longer. How long? Maybe 25 years or so. So um, we carried out the first um, robotic surgery in 2005, me and my team in, in UK, um, uh, um, some, some 15, 16 years ago. Um, and uh, ever since then, we have moved on to uh, uh, other forms of surgery. So basically, when you say computer-aided surgery, basically it means um, we do the x-rays and the x-rays are fed to the computer. The computer decides what angles these implants should be put in this patient so that you get the best, uh, what you call, the best results. So the preoperative planning is, is, uh, is, is given to us, the size of the implant that needs to be put in, what angles the bone has to be cut, uh, so that you can place the implants precisely. So no more, it takes away a lot of eyeballing. So implant components with greater accuracy, reduce blood loss because we don't open up the medullary canal, reduce incidence of transient hypoxia and confusion, reduce surgical and radiological uh, outliers. So sometimes, and in, in, uh, in this way, you, you know where your implant is going. Uh, so better surgical outcome increases the implant longevity. So then we um, have now migrated to robotic assisted knee replacement. Um, my first robotic uh, knee replacement was in November, uh, sorry, September last year. So um, um, why, um, why, why has it been slow? Why, why, why haven't we embarked on a bigger scale? Um, first of all, whenever technology comes in, we want to make sure that technology has stood its time and the results are very good. So especially for joint replacement surgeries, uh, if you do not have an, uh, at least three to five years follow up, it's impossible to, to jump into the bandwagon and take on the technology. So the technology is here. And uh, the other thing is, of course, the cost of the, of this, this, this robots. Um, they're, they're pretty expensive. Um, most of these robots cost anywhere between three to five million ringgit uh, per, per robot. And there are also a lot of consumables to be utilized. Uh, but of course, um, there's always this question whether the price that you're paying is balances out the, the outcome that you have. Um, and and, and the, the economic studies have all proven that there's a shorter hospital stay, uh, better outcome, less pain, uh, less bleeding, less side, uh, what do you call uh, incidence of uh, fat embolism from, from, such, from such technology. So definitely there is an advantage in using such technology. Um, so these robotic assisted surgeries are surgeon centered. Uh, they are assisted surgeries. They don't. The robot doesn't do the surgery. The robot stands as an assistant to the surgeon. They are accurate and they are reproducible. So once you get your angles right, I, I, I can do it. I can pass it to Betty to do it. I can pass it to anybody else who is trained uh, to use the robots, and they will be able to get the same or similar uh, accurate, uh, reproducible results. And they are very, very efficient. 
So basically, a patient walks into the suite, um, sees me, and then I send the patient down for an x-ray. In that x-ray, um, there is this calibrating balls that you put on, on, the, on the patient's uh, uh, limb when they do the x-rays. And then those x-rays are now uh, uh, fed onto the computer. The computer will uh, do the morphometry marking of the femur, the angles, uh, we'll look at the condyle size, the, the flexion, the extension, uh, the ligament, uh, how far the bones are in between, uh, between them, and then come up with a 3D, uh, what you call configuration. Uh, and it also includes the cartilage uh, in, 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 in its measurement. Um, so then, um, so basically this is how the robot arm looks like. The robot arm uh, brings this cutting jig onto the bone. So basically I have to make the incision, clear the soft tissue, expose the bone, and then um, uh, press the buttons for the robot to bring its arm right to the bone. So once it brings this uh, jig onto the bone, um, then I put the pins on and then I use a saw to cut through this, uh, through this, this, this uh, small space. Um, so basically I, my, my, my position to cut now is fixed and I can't make an error. Um, so you know, if, I, if I do a recut um, of two millimeters, exactly two millimeters will actually come out. So that's how precise the cuts are. Uh, so you cannot, it's very, very, there's very little room for, uh, for, for error when you do such things. Um, this is um, a, a picture of how, when we were doing our surgery, uh, this is at Sunway Medical Center. Um, so that's the operating side, that's me, uh, I've got, uh, an assistant, um, that's the, 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 the implant vendor, and that's the scrub tech, and that's our anesthetist. And this is the robot camera. So the camera is viewing where the bones are. There are trackers on the bone, which is picked up by the camera. And then um, it's connected to the robot, which is on my, on my left. Uh, so then the robot arm is brought into the field to do the cuts. Yeah, okay, I think the video doesn't work, sorry. Um, sorry, yeah. So, okay, so new technology. So new, new technology is very attractive and have constantly evolved. They expand the possibilities and the surgical indications, they improve our knowledge for knee biomechanics. They also try to restore native knee function. So basically that's the function of this robot slide. Right? That's the advantage of using them. So without, uh, with them, you, you at the end of the day, you try and bring them back to the native knee alignment uh, for your patients. Um, they, they, they promise better surgical outcome. There's an increase in plant longevity. And of course, all this translates at the end of the day to uh, increase in patient satisfaction. Um, so these are some of the few pictures I'm gonna show you about how the knee replacement looks like. This is one of the patients which I've operated about, I think maybe the past three weeks or so. Uh, a lady with bilateral knee virus, a virus knee, severe pain, unable to walk. You can imagine there's no cartilage left at, at all on this side. The other side is also osteophytes already. Um, uh, so we decided to do the knee replacement. You can see how accurate and how straight and how beautiful the knee is now. Uh, and you can only ex uh, appreciate how comfortable this patient is. And, and she, after she had done this, she was already asking when I can get my other, other knee done. And, and she has been having this knee for the longest time. Um, uh, and suffering for the past five, six years. So sometimes it's just getting them past that stumbling block to explain for them to understand that, you know, uh, this will give them good results. Um, this, is an, uh, this is how the, the, the pre-op planning in, in the robot looks like. So some is a patient with 15 degrees of val uh, valgus knee and we can actually correct it up to about three degrees. Um, this is a picture of uh, another lady who, who was referred to me by another orthopedic colleague uh, say that you know this lady's got severe bilateral valgus knee and say that you know um, maybe the robotics could help her achieve a, a much straighter knee so they said yeah fine we went ahead and did a bilateral knee replacement for her and look how straight she is now um, so she's not only gotten her knee straight uh, she's gained length uh, height uh, and she's, she's 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 a very very happy patient in fact um, i think day two day three she was already saying that you know I've never been able to walk so comfortably and, uh, I, and I think I can, I, I would like to go back home. So yeah, so yeah, this is how grateful patients feel, you know, when you, when you give them from this to this, you can imagine how uh, happy they are. 
Now, most of us use now um, uh, high flex knee replacement. Uh, so allow this allows the patient to flex the knee up to about 150, 147, 150, 155 degrees. So that it, in a way helps a lot of our Asian patients um, because some of them want to still go back to kneeling, squatting. Some of them want to go back to being able to pray. So yeah, so this is another example of a patient who was, had surgery and then which used uh, what you call a high flex knee implant and you can see how much she can flex and she's come back for another knee surgery after some time. Um, and this is another uh, patient who is very happy after a knee replacement. He's able to uh, sit cross leg, I'm sure. And uh, by this, he can actually also uh, be able to uh, pray in his uh, regular way. So um, um, this is another patient who's got bilateral severe knee virus deformity. And you can also appreciate that she's had her uh, uh, cabbage and bypass done for her heart. And so um, these are the kind of patients that we see with multiple comorbids. Um, and that's how the knee looked like. Imagine the cavity, the space, there's hardly anything left. The bone, uh, not only the bone is gone, but also the, the, the cartilage is gone, the bone is even gone. So in this kind of patients, we, we, we need to have a stem down, we need to put bone graft, that's why there's screws and the rest of the stuff to make them more stable. Um, this is another lady with a bilateral knee, oh. osteoarthritis. Um, can you imagine this knee walking around? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is she's just basically locked. Uh, the, the she's thing just, it is already painful. Exactly. So she's just um, she's just created a, a crater and she's locked herself. One condyle has just gone in and locked into yeah. that crater. Um, and, and and so when we did in, in, so in this kind of patients where there's a lot of uh, bone loss, there's a lot of ligament instability. Obviously, you need to do use use a, a more constrained implant. What do you call as the uh, what do you call a revision implant for these kind of patients. Um, yeah, so I hope this works. So here? Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, one second. I'll just see when I see whether this works or not. Uh, okay, it's not working. It's actually a very uh, a nice video of showing you how. It, a knee replacement surgery uh, uh, animated. So yeah, so, uh, before I end, uh, so yesterday's dream is today's memory. So basically we, we dream about doing navigated surgery. We have passed that now, 16 years. Now we're on to robotic surgery. So uh, the future is here. Uh, this is what we call as cutting edge surgery. And, uh, and this is all at the end of the day for the betterment of our patients. Yeah, with that, thank you. Wow, it's been a very interesting lecture. I. I'm very um, enlightened actually. It makes uh, cardiology look like Jurassic uh, kind of uh, practice. Okay, we do have some questions. Okay, and uh, Serena asks, can the osteochondral allograft be applied in hip joint as well? Uh, yes. Uh, yes and no. Um, depends on what, what's, what's actually happened to the hip. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. If a patient has got osteonecrosis... Okay. Oh, hold on. Sorry. Do you mind I'm, uh, not sharing, stopping your share so that I can... Oh, yeah, yeah. I can stop. I can stop. Yeah. yeah. That would be good. I also forgot. Ah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, basically, if in, in patients who have got osteonecrosis of the femoral neck or femoral head, in those kind of patients, yes, we can introduce a, what you call, um, allograft. But for osteoarthritis of the hip, uh, allografts don't work very well, uh, simply because uh, the weight in the hip joint simply cannot, uh, the, the allografts cannot take the, 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 what do you call the weight, and they will eventually give weight. Uh, and you know that the hip is a, a uh, is, is not a biplanar, uh, what do you call, um, joint. It is it's actually a 360, uh, so you need to have uh, ligaments all around it in order to make sure that the hip joint is well functioning. So yeah, only part, not the whole hip joint. Okay, on follow up this, uh, where you do the allograft and your, your grafting, right? Uh, it is meant for patients with small amount of damages, right? How do you assess these damages? Ah, okay. 
So basically, when they come to see us, they say, oh no, um, I've got knee pain. So when you do the x-ray, you, you realize oh. that they have got osteoarthritis. But when you when, when we look at the x-ray, we find that the, the you suspect they have got osteoarthritis based on clinical uh, history and signs. But when you do an x-ray, you don't find the joint space very badly damaged. Yeah. So there's still quite a bit of bone uh, uh, joint space, but yet their pain doesn't correspond to the x-rays. So then you realize that, okay, look, there's something else that's going on. Either they've got a meniscus tear, they've got a ligament sprain, or they've got a hole in the cartilage, which when we do an MRI, we'll be able to pick that up. I see. So, so for then, MRI. Mm. MRI, and then following the MRI, what we usually put up the patient for is an arthroscopic procedure. I see. Uh, in that arthroscopic procedure, it acts as a diagnostic as well as also a treatment procedure. So that's where we, we that's how we do it. So the arthroscopic procedure would then immediately you may may or may not do something for them. True. So if 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 if, if we already suspect things enough and we have got all the things on board, like. If you want to do an allograft procedure, you must have the allograft available and you need to order the allograft because storage is very important. So, uh, so it's important to bring the allograft and keep the allograft. So for that purpose, uh, usually if it's an allograft procedure, um, it will be a secondary procedure rather than a primary procedure. But things like halofast, autografts and all that, uh, we can do it on, on, on the spot. If we have the consent and we have, we have primed the patient, we can always go ahead and do but the only, like, like I said, the, 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 the only problem with this is the patient must be very ready to do it because the post-op care is very, very important. The rehab will take time. The patient will not be able to wait there for a while. And young patients are the ones who need these procedures and the young ones are the ones who are impatient, uh, who want to be able to wait there, want to go back to sports, want to go back to work. Uh, so it can be a bit of a challenge. So you must, they must be very well informed. Uh, they must be very well counseled in order for them to undergo such procedures. Now, total knee replacement, you said, can last for a long time, right? Yes. The current implants can last the patient 25 to 30 years. So um, there's a caveat to all this. Now, basically, um, when you say 25, 30 years, it basically depends on in vitro. Um, we put this uh, prosthesis and then we cycle the prosthesis. And the, the prosthesis, the cycle, the, prosthesis can go through like say 25 million cycles. So if I finish the 25 million cycles in 10 years, obviously I'm going to wear off the, 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 the polyethylene much earlier. I see. I so see. for somebody who is young, um, anywhere between 50, 55 and below, if they are still wage earners, they are working actively, uh, they may utilize the knee more than somebody who is 65, 70 years old. So that is one of the reasons why in the good old days, people tend to propose a patient for a knee replacement when they are 65, 70 years old. But what we realize over the years is our implants have gotten better. The longevity is better. And we also realize that patients go through a lot in their early years when they are productive, when they can be productive, um, looking after their knee and unable to do enough work. I'll give you an example, a 45, 48 years old lady who is working, who is actively a working uh, earning a living, looking after a family, has got bad osteoarthritis in the knee. You tell her that, you know, don't walk too much, don't sit too much, don't do exercises, take your painkillers and rest, and then um, wait until you are 60 years old to have your knee replacement done. So 12 years of her life is gone. So who's going to give her back the 12 years? At the same time, we don't want to put a knee replacement when she is 40 years old because we know the longevity is not good. So we, we stretch, but we, somewhere in the middle, we cut our losses and we say, okay, look, we give her a good quality of life and let her go ahead. Because otherwise, she's going to also take a lot of painkillers. And by the time she comes to us when she's 60, probably her kidneys are buggered and you know her, her risks are three or four times uh, her earlier risk of doing the surgery. Okay. Uh, we still have some questions. Ashwin asks uh, whether there's any prophylaxis for, for osteoarthritis for young people. Yeah, not so much of uh, basically, when osteo let, let's put it this way. When we move, there will be friction. And when there is friction, you will eventually wear off your cartilage. The question is whether you wear your, off your cartilage when you're 45, 50, 55, 60, or 80, or 90 years old. 
So that's for that reason, um, the older the population, the higher the incidence of osteoarthritis. So how can we look after your knee uh, or our knee it, to, to prevent it from get, getting bad osteoarthritis at an early age? So one, of course, is you must not abuse your knee, must look after your knee. You must make sure if you've got ligament injuries, you've got meniscus injuries, treat them early so that you get a stable knee. Make sure your muscles around your knee, your quadriceps, your hamstrings are strong to be able to support your knee. Uh, when you're doing a specific sports, make sure your attire is right, your shoes are right. If you're doing something very aggressive, make sure you have got protective uh, gear around your knee so that you don't damage your knee. Now, uh, moving on, moving forward, of course, things like weight reduction, we spoke about it just now. Mm -hmm. And uh, if, you're, if your knee is painful, seek treatment early. Um, the things like um, uh, what you call glucosamine uh, and chondroitin and the rest of the stuff, basically only uh, what you call um, delay the process of your osteoarthritis from getting worse. They do not, there's nothing that can reverse the process of osteoarthritis. As, as of now, there's no magic medication to tell me that, you know, if I have got grade two osteoarthritis and if I take this tablet routinely every day without fail for the next 10 years, my osteoarthritis is going to reverse to grade one. None. Full stop. Basically, what some of us feel, uh, some, some surgeons feel is that if you have got osteoarthritis, your ultimate treatment is a total knee replacement. The question is when you're going to have your total knee replacement. So Ferus asked whether is there any role in stem cell therapy for grade one and grade two symptomatic osteoarthritis? Okay, good question. Um, yeah, because cell, you didn't mention at all, right? Stem cell. Now the reason why I I I I didn't mention stem cell is because uh, so far um, there's a lot of research which is being done for stem cell. Um, we 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 don't see very many promising results being published. I see. Um, um, so that becomes a, 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 a difficult statement to, to, to defend. A lot of people claim, yes, that you know, the stem cells have done tremendous work. My, our, our, our regular question to everybody is, imagine if stem cell was the answer to osteoarthritis of the knee. Imagine if stem cell was the answer to all the osteoarthritis in the, of the knee. Then many patients would, would have stopped doing knee replacements. And in many countries, people wouldn't be spending so much of money uh, trying to improve the technology of a knee replacement. So there are still a lot of patients and, and all the money would have gone down in, in, in providing patients stem cell. So that's not actually happening yet. Um, so the, 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 the jury is still out there. And for the past 10 years or more, um, there's a lot. Um, of, 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 of stem cell research that has been, has been, which has been done. In, in fact, I think uh, even, even today, um, there, there's, there's an ongoing recruitment of studies uh, of, of stem cell in, in UKM, which is going on now again. So there, there, there are so many, many, many studies. Um, there are a lot of papers being produced, but uh, convincing 100% uh, that if I do stem cell, my knees are going to get better um, is still questionable. Uh, can I ask, when we talk about stem, uh, stem cell therapy, it is a direct injection into the joint, right? Yes. It's not in a, a trans infusion or anything like that. Yeah, so there, there, there are different types of stem cell. The mesenchymal stem cell, you can take stem cell from the adipose tissue, you can take stem cells from bone marrow, um, and then you process them, and then you inject them into the joint. It's not, it's not given IV, but it, it is injected into the knee joint so that it can home in the knee joint. Um, sometimes it's coupled with procedures like arthroscopic debridement. And uh, sometimes uh, if the patient has got a lax ligament or a torn ligament, uh, they, they repair the ligament and then they do the stem cell injection. Yeah, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's coupled together. So uh, on the same note about, uh, you know, prevention or prophylaxis, Jilinki asks whether avocado soy soy you unsaponified. Is it there? Is there any comment on osteoarthritis? Oh, sorry, uh, what, what was that again? Okay, if you look at the comment section, 
at the uh -huh. bottom, there's a, there is ASU, avocado soya unsepon, sepon. unsaponified. Mm. So it's soya, but now it's avocado soya. Um, yeah, so I mean, all this, um, basically the answer to it is I don't know the answer. Uh, I mean, it, it, uh, uh, people have uh, proposed various types of diet, uh, milk. Uh, oh, I see. It is a diet. Yeah, it's a diet um, for, 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 for knee osteoarthritis. But I mean, this basically comes under, under the group of supplements. And you know, um, it's difficult to prove or disprove them. Um, just like everything else is in medicine, as long as there's no you don't cause any danger to the patient. I think you can try and if it works for you, fine. Uh, but if you're going to spend a couple of million dollars buying this, then, then I think probably not the wise choice to do. Is there any reason why women get it more? Ah, very interesting question. Uh, I've been asked this time and again. Um, so basically, there, there, there are two uh, peak incidences or, uh, and uh, where pa uh, female patients are more exposed to osteoarthritis. At least this is the hypothesis now, okay. One, um, because of the regulation of menstrual cycle in a patient, um, the uh, females tend to have ligaments which are a bit more lax compared to men. Uh, and we all know if you measure the Q angle in females is far bigger than the men. A Q angle is basically the angle drawn from the anterior spalex spine to the patella and the patella downwards to the tibia tuberosity. So basically, the, angle, the gliding angle of the, of the patella. Now, um, with that also, um, uh, we, we get lots of ligament injuries in female athletes, um, uh, more ACL tears, more collateral ligament tears, more ankle ligament tears, because um, the, the ligaments are lax and hence uh, the joints are not, not strong enough to, uh, to sustain when they're doing vigorous activity. So that makes the knee joint a bit um, unstable on and off and uh, exposed to injuries. That is one group. The second group is um, when uh, female patients uh, uh, undergo menopause, um, uh, the, uh, all of a sudden, there's a sudden increase in body weight. Um, and sometimes it becomes That's very- That's not easy. true. <laughs> not, <laughs> not, 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 not in all of them, not in all of them. Uh, but there, there, there's, there's a significant, I mean, if you see across all females, uh, there's a sudden increase in, in, in body weight, especially in the group after menopause. I see. Uh, uh, so uh, that also, I mean, basically this is the hypothesis. Lah, okay, so in, in that group, again, um, they do, uh, the sudden increase in body weight tends to also uh, increase the load in the knee. Uh, but having said that, I've seen a lot of females who are menopause who still keep themselves very well, very fit. You know, some of them are still uh, jumping around, uh, doing a lot of activities, sports activities, and they can maintain themselves very well. So, yeah. So, but these are two main reasons why uh, people... Is pregnancy about. one of the reasons for this lax, you know... Um... There's always a possibility. I mean, there, there, it's never been studied, but, but there's always a possibility that the pregnancy again contributes to, the, to that. Okay, we've done very well. I, I really think that you, you were excellent. And I Thank think you. that, uh, yeah. Uh, can uh, I just address one more thing? I think somebody, Serena, said, oh, yeah, I Serena. think she meant piascadine, uh, though it is a group A evidence, uh, I eat avocado and soybean. Yes, I mean, Piascadine is another uh, supplement that one can take for, 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 for osteoarthritis of the knee, uh, um, though it works in a different way compared to uh, what you call uh, glucosamine. But yes, Piascadine, uh, there are studies to show that Piascadine does help patients. But I, mean, I just want to say this, whether you're on any form of supplement, uh, how I look at it is um, if somebody is on glucosamine for six weeks, a minimum of six weeks to two months. And if they do not, if it has not made any changes to them, then it's highly unlikely that they are going to benefit from taking this glucosamine for the next three years. So because sometimes when you see patients, you ask them, how long have you been on glucosamine? They say, oh, I've been on glucosamine forever. And has it made any difference? No, it has never. So that is another question uh, altogether. Yeah. So what? how I usually look at it is if I see a patient and the patient has never been on glucosamine, then I... And if they're in early stage of the disease, so you put them on glucosamine for a good uh, four to six weeks. 
and tell them not to expect it to be a magic drug because it's not a painkiller. Then and don't throw it off within the next first two weeks. At first two weeks, you expect maybe 10, 20 percent difference. Up to four weeks, maybe about 30 to 40 percent difference. Of course, there is this question whether it's a placebo effect or not, but only uh, the patients will be able to answer if they stop it or not uh, after they stop it. So at four weeks, when I see them back and they tell me, say, look, there's it has not made any difference whatsoever. Then I tell them, look, it's probably you're not going to benefit from it. Uh, because the general population, maybe over 70% of the patients, 50 to 70% may feel good. Uh, another 30 to 50% say it doesn't help them. So if, if, if you don't feel well and the knee is still troubling them, then we escalate to the next step, which is probably the injection. So this, this um, product that Serena is talking about, how do you pronounce it? Yes, Is it the? Uh, it, it comes in a. It comes in a capsule. It comes in a capsule. I see. And all this, how do they work? Actually, is it? Um, does it really fill up a space the uh, over the joint? Like no, okay. So basically, what 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 this uh, this the supplements do is, they uh, increase the viscosity of the fluid inside the knee. Oh, the it does. Fluid. Yeah. One, I mean, that's how it's, 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 it's meant to, to work. So it increases the viscosity. By increasing the viscosity, it reduces the friction. And by reducing the friction, the wear and tear is lesser. Hence, the cartilage can, can, can last longer. That's why it's never been meant to reverse the pathology. It doesn't reverse the pathology. So, yeah, so instead of losing, let's say, example, 0 0.1 millimeter cartilage a year, so now you lose 0 0.05 meals uh, of cartilage a year. So it, it doesn't stop, but it reduces the wear, reduces the, the I imagine that the pain must be really, really severe because a lot of people are acceptable to knee replacement. And uh, they True, uh, but again, sometimes, um, I mean, in, in my practice, I see sometimes patients, by the time patient comes to see me, they have already probably been with, the, with, with their GPs and the GPs have been doing a fantastic job looking after them for, for, for some time, five, 10 years. Uh, it comes a point where they cannot um, uh, stand the pain or their quality of life becomes bad. Yeah. And I always tell this to patients. I mean, if, if your life de is determined by the, how much your knee can do, not how much your heart can do, not how much your eyesight can do, not how much your wallet can do for you but if it if your knee determines whether you can go to your son's house whether you can drive your car whether you can climb the stairs uh, or you can walk in the mall or go to the shopping center or go to the mosque for a prayer or something so if your knee determines that that means your quality of life is bad and that is determined by your knee and that means you need to fix your knee the most amazing thing uh, the most amazing, one of the most amazing patients I've seen is I did a pre-op assessment for this knee replacement patient who was 86 years old. She had bilateral knee replacement. And two weeks later, she's riding her motorbike in Pulau Ketam. <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. So again, age is not the determinant factor of whether the patient can or cannot have surgery. What's important is uh, the physical uh, ability, not the chronological age. Um, uh, I, I think just my, my, my oldest patient for, I mean, hip replacement patients can become very, very old. Uh, maybe I've even seen patients up to 99, even 100 years old going for a knee for a hip replacement. But for a knee replacement, uh, I think my oldest patient was about 89 years old. In fact, last week I did uh, 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 another uh, consultant's mom who was 84, 85 years old. Yeah. Yeah. But, and and she's, she's so thankful because for her, the reason why she came to do the knee replacement is she's 84, 85, but she stays alone and she drives a car to the bank herself, to the market herself. Exactly. A lot of times it's because they are not mobile. Exactly. Yeah. So the mobility. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We will stop here. All right. I would like to thank you and I would like to wish everybody a very good new year ahead. We are really, today is the last month and... Um, you know, I've done this almost every week for the last one year. And this is the last session. 
<laughs> I'm so I'm so happy actually. I'm so proud of myself and I'm also so happy that I don't have any more session. I think I will go shopping from you should, you should, you should. Yeah. And then next week I next next year, um, I have to rethink what to do. I mean I'm going to continue. Okay, I'm going to stop recording now.